Welcome to the first part of this lecture, Intersectional Ecology for a Politics of Equality. The key questions we are going to ask ourselves in this lecture are, what are the consequences of the understanding that there are limits to economic growth? What does social justice mean in a finite world? And as a small footnote, data in these lectures are from mainstream, in some cases, quite conservative organizations and are in the public domain. There is nothing radical or controversial in the data I use. We live in the Anthropocene. Humans are the main force of change on this planet stronger than other geological forces, stronger than the tectonic plates that move continents, a change that will last, will last longer than the time humans have been on the planet. Using the words of UCL professor Mark Maslins, who builds on Naomi Klein, this will change everything forever. We shape the climate, the weather, we cause pandemics, droughts, mass extinctions. And my favorite definition of globalization uh, relates to when decisions taken by people somewhere in the world have profound effects on people somewhere else in the world who may be unaware of such a decision. This is not a new thing, actually, I like to think that globalization started in, 19, uh, 19, in 1494 when the Pope divided the Americas between the Spanish and the Portuguese with an, Im an imaginary line, no matter who was already living there. A decision that not only shaped the lives of millions of people at that time, but still shape their lives today. However, now, this is extreme. Consumption of a part of the world is creating misery for many others. And worse, it is creating an unlivable planet for future generations. Every action has a global impact. And environmental issues remind us that the world is a single place and requires global collective action. We need a global lens to understand our actions. Global has been an important motto for the movement struggling for an alternative, more just world. This implies acting locally, but thinking globally. Humans have radically transformed the planet biomass, just considering the weight of the vertebrate land animals. 67% is livestock, 32% is humans, and 1% wild animals. 10,000 years ago, it was a completely different story. Today's more than 77 billion land animals are farmed and killed each year. The total number of chickens and at any one time is more than three times higher than the number of people. Large majority of antibiotics is not given to people, but to animals and not sick animals, as it would be too expensive to identify the sick animals. Antibiotics are given to all industrial farm animals, creating antimicrobial resistance. Because of this, antibiotics lose their effectiveness at an astonishing and unprecedented rate. According to the World Health Organization, there are around 2 billion adults overweight. Of those, 650 million are considered to be affected by obesity. That equates to about 40% of adults age 18 or over who are overweight, and 13 of these obese. At the same time, 619 million people are hungry. The food system creates 30% of climate altering emissions. 80% of agricultural land is used for animal farming, which produce only 18% of global 
calorie supply. Animal farming is an insanely inefficient way to produce food, as 100 calories are needed to be fed to a cow to produce just one calorie of food. For the first time, the negative effects of human activity on our planet have been acknowledged, not only in the academic circles, but on the media. And there is widespread awareness of the dangers for humans. However, the consequences have not been clearly stated and dealt with, with appropriate policy. In 2013, in the negotiations leading up to the Sustainable Development Goals, the Indonesian government correctly pointed at the key issue, sustainable consumptions and production patterns. They were arguing, and I quote from their documents, promoting sustainable consumption and production patterns is essential for sustainable development. Developed countries should take the lead to move to sustainable production and consumption whereas developing countries should not increase their ecological footprint while achieving high standard of human development. As I will discuss in this series of lectures, this reframed the entire conversation around international development and global justice. What I introduce now is not new thinking, but was already widely known 15, 50 years ago. A group of top scientists at the MIT work on a report for the Club of Rome, The Limits of Growth, published in 1972. In this report, they conclude that possibly within as little as 70 years, our social and economic system will collapse unless drastic changes are made very soon. And they present two scenarios. If the present growth trends, I quote from the report, in work, population, industrialization, pollution, food production, and resource depletions continue unchanged, the limits to growth on this planet will be reached between, sometimes between, within the next 100 years. The most probable result will be a rather sudden and uncontrollable decline in both population and industrial capacity. Two, it is possible to alter these growth trends and to establish a condition of ecological and economic stability that is sustainable. Far into the future. The state of global equilibrium could be designed so that the basic material needs of each person on earth are satisfied and each person has an equal opportunity to realize his individual human potential. If the world's people decide to strive for this second outcome rather than the first, the soon they begin working to attain it, the greater will be their chances of success. Even in 1972, these concepts were not new. An economist, Kenneth Boulding, already in 1966 was saying, who believes in an endless growth in a finite world is either a foolish or an economist. This idea of a finite world with a finite stock of resources was first elaborated by Professor Nicholas Georgescu Rogan, who incorporated in the economics the ecological constraints. Over 20 years ago, the conservative organization World Wildlife Fund, whose patron is Prince Philip, who is the husband to our Majesty the Queen uh, in the UK, concludes its report saying that if every human being on earth today began consuming and polluting at the rate of the average North American or Western European, at least two more planets, would be needed to provide the necessary resources. This means that if human beings want to continue to live on our planet and not in deteriorating condition, they have to live on the interests of the earth. 
without depleting its capital. In other words, we have to live within the self-regenerating capacity of the biosphere. If some of the capital, for instance, oil, is used to develop technologies that make it easier to live within the regenerating capacity, that is fine. But the continuous use of non-renewable resources for consumption will lead to disaster. From the 1980s, the world consumes more resources than nature can renew. Said differently, what we are doing now is using up the capital of the Earth's resources when we should be living on its interest. In the last 60 years, I have seen an, that I've seen an intensification of globalization. They have been called the development age. The development age was funded on this pillar. Justice is created by economic growth. Therefore, the desire for greater equality will drive growth. Recently, it became clear that conventional growth cannot create justice due to the finite nature of the biosphere and its resources. And this is a strong argument that is made by Wolfgang Sachs in his book, Fair Future. What the mainstream economics have been spreading with the ideology of economic development was that the cake of wealth could grow forever and we could divide bigger slices. Development was the idea that first we need to grow and then everyone will benefit from a larger cake. It didn't matter if the cake was unfairly distributed as long as the cake kept expanding. Therefore, inequality was not a concern. Now it is clear that the cake cannot grow. The discovery of limits to growth implies that more justice in the world cannot be attained at the consumption levels of the industrial countries. In other words, it is not possible to advocate for global justice within an ecological perspective without changing the way of life in developed countries. And this is a major revolution in the basic narrative of development. 